Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Synergy Virtual Summit, which is a cooperation between Baptist Health International in South Florida and Synergy in the Caribbean. My name is Everard van Kemenade. I have a PhD in quality management and I am a senior lecturer and researcher at the Utrecht University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. But besides that, I am the secretary of Synergy, which is the Caribbean leadership network in healthcare, uh, consisting of 10 um, healthcare organizations, uh, hospitals, uh, auxiliary homes, uh, mental health uh, institutes, uh, on three small islands in the Caribbean, uh, Seba, St. Eustatius, and St. Martin. Being small requires synergy. So in the beginning of 2018, Brechtje Boetekees, who is operations manager at the White and Yellow Cross Care Foundation on St. Martin, and she is now Synergy's president, and I decided to launch a learning community in order to improve the quality of life of the people that we serve. And today is the fifth Synergy meeting in a row and this time, the day starts with this Synergy Virtual Summit that we organized together with Galit Hakim, who you will see in a moment, and many others from Baptist Health International who made this possible. And we decided to make the session also accessible for people outside the Synergy Network. The topic, of course, is COVID-19. The three islands all have uh, encountered uh, the, the virus, of course, I would say. On Seba, as far as I know, these data are from a few days ago. Um, there are five people who got the virus from a total population of 2,000. On St. Asatius, with 3,200 inhabitants, about 19 people got uh, the virus. And on St. Martin, the largest island of the three, around 44,000 inhabitants, 1,555 people were infected and 27 people died. It, the economic, social and psychological impact of the virus is enormous also on these three islands. We are very happy that uh, Dr. Gilberto Torres Madris uh, was available to help us and understand uh, more about the virus and uh, the possibilities of the vaccine. We wish everyone an informative and interesting session. And since Synergy values interaction, we uh, invite you to make use of the chat function and we will select some of the questions there uh, for the uh, uh, question and answer session after the presentation from uh, Dr. Torres Madrid. Um, and now I'd like to uh, introduce Galit Hakim, uh, who is one of the assistant vice presidents at Baptist Health International. Galit, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Everard. It is a pleasure to be here. Good morning, distinguished guests. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Galit Hakim, assistant vice president of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International and assistant professor at Florida International University. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I want to begin by thanking Everard and the Synergy team for facilitating this opportunity for Baptist Health International to provide you with information on an important global health topic that is top of mind for many these days. Before I introduce our special guest this morning, I would like to take a minute uh, to tell you about Baptist Health. Baptist Health South Florida is the largest healthcare organization in the region. With 11 hospitals and more than 100 outpatient centers spanning across Miami-Dade, Monroe, Broward, and Palm Beach counties, Baptist Health has internationally renowned centers of excellence in cancer, cardiovascular care, orthopedics and sports medicine, and neurosciences. It has grown to be the largest healthcare organization in South Florida. 
consistently ranked by Fortune as one of the best companies to work for, and by Ethisphere as one of the world's most ethical companies. Baptis invests in building its international operation many years ago, and today has uh, one of the largest hospital-based international healthcare programs in the United States, with more than 14,000 international visits each year for, from over 100 countries. At Baptist Health International, our team strives every day to continue to support our mission and provide the highest level of attention to our patients and physician colleagues, both home and international. With a welcoming multilingual and multicultural staff committed to providing a first-class patient-centered experience, we take pride in welcoming patients to our city and working closely with physicians to meet their needs and expectations. From air ambulance and commercial air transfers to booking accommodations, Baptist Health International offers 24-hour personalized service to our international guests. Our organization is truly a global leader in healthcare, the premier provider in the region for compassionate quality care. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Gilberto Torres Madris. Dr. Torres Madris is an international medicine and infectious disease board certified physician at Baptist Health South Florida. He received his medical training at Central University of Venezuela, um, Jose Maria Vargas School of Medicine in Caracas, Venezuela, followed by a residency in internal medicine and a clinical fellowship in infectious diseases and tropical medicine at Vargas Hospital in Caracas, Venezuela. During that time, he also served as an internal medicine staff physician and assistant professor. He then completed a residency in internal medicine at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, followed by a clinical fellowship and a research fellowship both on infectious diseases at Tufts University and Tufts Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. In addition to his medical training, Dr. Torres Madrid holds a master's in science and clinical research from the Tufts University uh, Sackler School of Graduate uh, Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Torres Madrid is part of the South Florida Infectious Disease and Tropical Medicine Center and currently serves as a clinical assistant professor at Herbert Wardine College of Medicine at Florida International University. As an author, Dr. Torres Madrid has published many medical articles, abstracts, and textbook chapters and is an experienced researcher. He's a member of several professional organizations, including the American College of Physicians and the Infectious Disease Society of America. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Gilberto Torres Madrid. Dr. Torres Madrid, what a pleasure having you here today. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here, uh, sharing our experience dealing with this virus for the past 11 months. And I wanna share with you guys some of the lessons that we have learned. Over this time, I had to disclose that I had no conflict of interest. So I don't talk for any company that, that produce or develop any of the virals, uh, antiviral or vaccine medication. And I'm not receiving any payment from this talk. Uh, Another disclaimer is that what we are discussing today may be not certain in the future. So this is an evolving field where the thing had changed very, 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 very quickly and very fast. Uh, today's discussion is based on the best evidence available at this moment. And I want to start with this. Uh, I'm gonna give you a uh, time to, to read about uh, the, the, this quote for Charles Holm, and it's basically explained what, what is happening. So we, we, we try just to make theories or hypotheses without having all the data. So, so we're gonna, that's gonna lead to mistakes. So, uh, so one thing that, that is the experience that, that we're sharing and uh, is coming from Baptist where, where I serve and, and I have to disclose that by January 14, 2021, more than 10,000 patients has been discharged from uh, our Baptist facility. I'm basic, I, I base in, in, in the main hospital is like this beautiful facility that is a Baptist hospital of Miami. We're getting most of the patient, but this number come from all the facilities. Dr. Torres Madres, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, we cannot see your presentation. Can you please share it? Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let me see. 
Oh. It's okay. It, it sounded like a very nice introduction. So we're oh yeah, I I, I I was navigating the presentation. Let me see what happened here. Share screen. Oh, I see. Okay. Are you guys seeing now? We're seeing it. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, that, that was already passed about this. That was the, the quote by Charles Holm that, that I wanted you to read. And that, that was the beginning of the presentation. I apologize that you didn't see it before. And uh, I was talking that all the information or all the experience is based of encounter for us. So in the Baptist system, we have by January 14, 2021, more than 10,000 patients discharged. And uh, most of the patients, so the, the biggest facility, Baptist Hospital Miami, where I, where I work, and it's a beautiful facility that we have over here. And I just basically say the number by November, that is, uh, we, it's just one hospital we have almost 3,000 cases we uh, in in July you can see that was probably the when we have or, or the were the busiest uh, month of so we almost a thousand patients just in a single institution okay the, 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 I want to try to so I say the, the the were 10 lessons and the so I divide the lessons about transmission of the viral precautions mask use, super spreading and super spreading events, diagnostic techniques, treatment, difference between, so how we have modified the concept of isolation, quarantine, reinfection that we're trying to see some, and uh, how we uh, tackle the epidemiological control and I'm gonna end with vaccines. We'll start with the lesson number one, transmission. So there has been a debate about the mode of transmission of this virus and uh, the people say these are born, these droplets. So the, the, the main mode of transmission we see is this droplet and contact. However, in certain circumstance, a small uh, droplets can get suspended in the air and that probably the, the concept of six feet or two meters in a special location probably doesn't apply and it can be involved with, with, with transmission. And uh, so basically we're gonna talk about, so when we talk, when we breathe, when we sing, when we laugh, we spell particles uh, from the airway and uh, that's micro, that's, that's heavy particles that we see here they travel no more than two meters and they can get into the surface. Uh, when people can touch that surface it is contaminated with virus and self inoculate. And that is more, more particle that can travel a little bit longer. Uh, so knowing this, we, we, we know for now that the mask use, social distancing, hand hygiene, and so first cleaning and disinfections, they are key in controlling the virus. And we know that the, the dynamic of viral transmissions in close space and very, uh, particularly if they are very crowded and we were, poor ventilation can change. And probably the two meters is not enough. And we have several examples to, to, so in Canada, for example, in October, 2020, in a, in a, in a spinning gym, so they, 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 they wanted to, to they open the genes, 50% of capacity. They was required to use the mask before and after the class. There was extensive cleaning of the equipment. The bike were separate, safe fit. However, they, they, they have 74 cases linked to the gym. So with two staff members got sick and 46 athletes got sick and those passed to 26 more people. Probably in a, in a closed space uh, where people are breathing, you know, and, and, and uh, exercising, probably the, the C fit doesn't apply uh, to that. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, when those that we do exercise, they heavily exercise, to breathe with a mask in is, 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 very, is very heavy. It's another example in a Korean restaurant where we're starting to understand about closed space and ventilation where the, the, depending on the way that the air circulates, uh, one, one case, 
so was able to 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 pass the infection to other guests in the restaurant was was not direct exposure. Um, so and that is another case that was reported in the literature that outbreak in one restaurant in 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 in, in China where the in this case was able and uh, the, just basically this a diagram of the of the of the circulation there was able to infect several of the the the, the members that were sharing the same table people that were in the table behind and uh, probably they were because they were there was circulation that was no no cases on E and F and uh, these are uh, the work in that call center in Korea where you see all the blue, there were cases infected and were people that were working, you know, shoulder to shoulder, um, very busy. Um, most of the cases were in this area and a few cases were to, to other area. There were no cases in other floors, uh, even though they, they were in the 11 floors. So probably riding in the elevator wasn't a bit uh, a risk. Probably the most risk probably is to be in a contained space with no adequate circulation and for a long time. Mass use. At the beginning of the pandemic on, on February, March, we were not recommending uh, the massive mask use. One, one reason that we didn't have enough and we want to preserve those for the healthcare worker. The other thing that we had the idea that was a false sense of protection and probably people with the mask, they, they will feel like they were Superman and, and touch the mask or having a mask not properly used. And now we thought it probably was not useful. But over the time we have seen that the, 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 the countries and the community that have enforced the mass use have been a dramatic change, not only in the cases of COVID, but it's also other respiratory diseases and that we can compare other respiratory diseases, and we have used the influenza as a model because we have data of influenza season for every year. So we know that the masks are proven to be protective, not even because the, 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 there's a mechanical barrier and this dynamic of two meters or six feet of expelling the droplets that basically get contained in a closed space, but it's not, not only protect you to get it, but protect others. So universal maxi use is, is, is the way that we should move. Uh, one thing that any mass is better than nothing. Uh, we learn also that no everyone needs to use N95 or, or, or medical mass. So home main mass for, for fabrics and with multiple layer works. The only thing that, that, that we don't recommend is they use the mask with valve because so the, with the valve, so people are spelling droplets. So they get, probably they get protected themselves, but they don't protect others. And, 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 and interesting what I, what I was telling you, so they had the, the data for our influenza in Australia from 2015 to 2020. And you see that the spike of cases in the influenza season, but in 2020, this basically there was no influenza. And that was because they were using mass. And I were using influenza because we had data of other respiratory diseases. With COVID, we have only data for one year, so we cannot compare other years. So, uh, and that, that there's something that 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 happens all all over. So we we'll see. So how how the 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 use of mass probably is, was the so we see the 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 influence activity and then with the use of mass so basically zero cases and that can be so no even in 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 Australia in Chile in South Africa and I bring in this data because by that time we will review that remember the influenza season for that is in our summer so so and and you can you can see the in the bottom is basically no activity or influenza. And, all the, and that you can that, do that for any respiratory virus. So, Anna, is there any question I can stop? Remember that we had a missing agenda and I, I need to cover this in, 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 in 45 minutes. We, we, will, uh, we will go for questions at the end, doctor. Don't worry about it. 
Okay, okay. So the thing is, like, a, we, 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 the, the, we learn about super spreading events, and, uh, and, 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 and we know that when there's big gathering, this is a, a, a word also for, from China that show a, a bar, and all these yellow dots, there are cases from the bar, we don't, we, they don't know who was the index case in this case, but from this bar, they were able to trace all these contacts and then they went and passed there to the family or, the, or in the green ones or to the co-workers. The same thing, this is a wedding, see multiple cases. Uh, this is in a, a temple, I say what a Buddhist a temple also, when there they were able to pass to the to the co-workers and to the family and that is basically showing that somehow we we have cluster of cases mm -hmm. so we can identify who was in the case and how without a, the adequate protection they can pass to 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 co-work and to the family and when you put this in the city so basically you can have model so cluster 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 when you have Big, 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 big cases. So, so in this model, 50% were direct contact, 90% were uh, secondary infections. And it's something that, 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 that we're seeing here in South Florida, in Miami, that, that most of the cases of the cluster of cases we see is because gathering in houses with family members of well, multiple uh, different household members. And, and, and this graph that we, 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 we share with the community is to try to, to understand the risk of transmission. So you are at home alone with your household member, the risk is low, but if you go to group gathering indoor, different house member, the risk goes up. Probably being outside with your own group is minimal risk, sharing with other people that you don't know if they are taking precaution without masks, increase the risk. So or we're, we're gonna move to diagnostics test. Basically we, so the gold standard for diagnostics is the PCR. It's precise, it's highly sensitive, but it's expensive. It's not easy available and the speed result depends on the demands. So you can have a result in two hours, but you had 200 cases and you had two, so that can take one or two days that we're seeing there. And one thing that's important, you cannot predict the future. So you have a negative test, that doesn't mean you're not gonna have a positive test uh, later on the disease. But I think that it's been used a lot, particularly in South America and Central America, is the serology, so the measure of antibodies. And, um, and we're, they are using IgM and IgG as a rapid test. And I have just showed this, this, this graphic when we you see, so very early in the disease, so depending what you do, the so when, when you have exposure, the test can be negative, the PCR test. But once you get the viral load increasing, your test can be positive, becomes positive. But you see the antibodies, it's very late in the course. I mean, so we, by, the, by the end of, of, of week one is when we're starting having a spy of IgM and, and IgG, and that lasts long. So on the same thing, so, so what you see is a probably serology or rapid test is not the greatest um, tool to make diagnosis. So when, we're made, when they are positive, we're already very probably advancing the disease. Uh, the only thing they are easily available, but the, the use of is limited. We particularly in the US, we don't pay attention to IgM at all. So what we're using IgG is just to measure exposure. And as a patient where it's supposed to have immunity, but we're not doing that to make diagnosis. Another player that probably is helping a lot is the antigen determination. Why? Because it's less expensive, more available. The only downside is that it has decreased sensitivity when you compare with the gold standard that is a PCR, but they give you a rapid result. Um, um, and I want to share this, 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 this graphic with you. Uh, so about so the yellow thing is uh, is the yellow core is the PCR. We see that we initiate when you have the exposure in zero, you can you can have positive PCR sooner than the one that you have with the antigen. 
The only thing that we like about the antigen and when the, the disease passes, it's like it becomes negative. The PCR can be positive longer, even though there are no transmission or, or no risk of infection. And what you can see, the, I, the, the IgG lasts over, the, o, o, over time and the IgM, so also pass over time. Sometimes we see patients in the convalescent phase and still having a GM positive. So that doesn't help us at all. So we don't use a GM at all. Uh, we, we rely more on uh, rapid uh, antigen testing, PCR, and we use the IgG for to mention prior exposure. Treatment. So the, the way that we treat patients, we try to use antiviral therapy immunological therapy to try to modulate the exuberant uh, immunological response of some of the patient supported treatment. So in the supported treatment, we had the oxygen supplementation, uh, the use of anti anticoagulation when needed, and we manage the complication. We follow the NIH uh, protocol recommendations and uh, basically the only antiviral that we're using is the remdesivir. Uh, the immunological therapy that we're using at this point is the desametasone only when patients have respiratory insufficiency, when they have hypoxemia, we don't use desametasone in, 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 in mild cases. Usually you use those in the hospital, okay? Uh, one thing that, 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 that we're, we're, we're using is the monoclonal antibody for the patients. And uh, we have two, and in Baptist, so we have used over 500 uh, past week. Patients with risk for complication, but they don't require to be in the hospital. So it's only a few things that we use. And we have used in the past many other things. Uh, they, they, they don't work. So we use. Hydroxychloroquine and, and alone, and we acetromycin at the beginning of the pandemic. And one of the lesson lesson that we learned that didn't work, and we don't use, we removed that from our protocol. We also try to use antivirals, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, that they were using protease inhibitor using HIV. We started using, and then we saw the evidence that didn't work, and uh, we are not using at all. Corticosteroids, as I said only in the cases they have respiratory insufficiency uh, um, with hypoxemia. We use at the beginning interleukin-6 inhibitor. We're not using that too much because they were, we don't have extra evidence. We are also moving away from convalescent plasma because the data doesn't support the use. We're still using with remdesivir, even though this uh, controversy with WHO organization, but we're still using. It's the only antiviral that we have available. And we use the anti-monoclonal antibody, as I mentioned, in the cases they are mild disease with risk for complication. And we, do, we use as a now patient. We don't admit those patients. The patient required to be admitted, there are no candidates for that. So in summary, what could work, definitely oxygen supplementation, pronation, self-pronation is like, even the patients are in conscious and they are on nasal cannula was then to pronate in safety spirometry. I mentioned the steroid for the one that had respiratory insufficiency. Anticoagulation, all the patients, they get admitted to the hospital, they, 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 are, they are placed in prophylaxis anticoagulation and depending on the risk, if they are intensive care union or they have a manifestation of thrombosis, we use full uh, anticoagulation. We're still using the remdesivir as I mentioned and, and we're using more than mono, monoclonal antibodies in the outpatient setting. What may not work, convalescent plasma, some physicians still using those, but definitely we stopped using because they, probably the amount of the antibodies that, that, that they, they, they are in the convalescent plasma is no, the highest, and most of the patients were, were, were testing, they already have IgG. So uh, we're moving away for the interleukin-6 blockers. So we use, uh, we were very excited at the beginning, but really we were more complications than benefits. And, uh, you know, there are some data talking about vitamin D prevention. We don't know. I mean, in, all patients get 
sometimes by the primary care physician, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, but nothing of those has been proved, proven to work. We, what doesn't work? Acetromycin doesn't work for COVID because it works for other, th other things, a great antibiotic. Any antibiotic at all, at least there is some super bacterial infection. We have seen that the rate of bacterial infection in our patients is pretty low. I have to confess initially when the patients were very sick, we were using broad antibiotic and then we feel confident there are no, there are no need for those, at least the patient develop ventilator associated pneumonia or hospital acquired pneumonia, that's the case. Hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, we're only using for rheumatoid arthritis or for malaria, for sensitive malaria, we're not using for our patient at all. And we're not, and we're, we're not using Calitra for our patient either, so. And I only few patients are HIV, they, they're being taking that medication, so, so it's no using any longer for us. So we're gonna talk about another lesson that was the, the, the isolation and quarantine. Isolation is when you are sick and you need to be isolated for the quarantine is when you are exposed. And a thing that we learned initially when, when, when at the beginning of the pandemic, we wanted to have two negative PCR 24 hours apart. And then we learned the patient could have positive PCR for weeks. So I had a case of a patient that, that, that was also for 12 weeks, a nursing home patient that we couldn't discharge to the back to the nursing home, that, uh, even though she had no symptoms. And then we learned that the PCR measure, uh, the, 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 the genetic pre material presence of the virus, but those viruses are not viable. Uh, they, you, you cannot culture or recover those viruses. There are no infection after 10 days. So we are not requiring PCR to lift the isolation anymore. So basically, we, according to the CDC, and that's what we're doing in Baptist, is the patient have mild disease and no mild moderate disease and have no immunosuppression. They, they 10 days of illness, we improvement of the symptom of ephemeral for 24 hours, patient can lift the isolation. And where are we using that for healthcare workers? So we're not requiring the healthcare worker to have PCR anymore. That was one of the lessons I want to learn. However, the patient has severe disease. They have been very ill and they are immunocompromised. We extend that period for two, 20 days, three weeks. And with the quarantine, because the, the so initially oh, we recommended 14 days uh, because the incub incubation period of the virus, they can be until two weeks. But they will learn that 80% of the patient become sick after five days, the one they want to become sick. So we're moving the quarantine to 10 days without test and seven days with a negative test. However, there's a recommendation that for the four days or this, uh, the other week, the patient to have uh, some kind of precaution with others, but they can leave the, the, the quarantine if they have tests at the, uh, a week of uh, no symptoms or 10 days with no symptoms. <laughs> Reinfection. Initially, we thought that probably the immunity could last longer, but we have been seeing cases of reinfection. They're very rare, they're not frequent, and they have been reported in the, in the, in the, in the literature. And uh, I don't think we don't see too much report because we're seeing or all cases very rarely. I mean, uh, I can tell you that I have seen probably only two cases of all, all the cases that I see in Baptist where, where, where has been probably a reinfection and, um, and there was at least six months after the initial infection. So what may happen, probably uh, people that mount uh, the deficient immune response this could be one thing that probably the immune response protective we don't know for how for how long we know that they in the first three months after the infection is very rare and i and we know that probably the patients are protected at least for three months maybe longer uh, we don't know if the different strain of different variants also have to do so initial some of the report there were different variants um, the other thing that we don't know is the immunity prevents transmission. So probably you, the immunity prevents you from getting sick, but we don't know if, 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 if that prevents to get you an asymptomatic and pass to other. And the other thing that we are hoping, I mean, the, the herd immunity will work if the immunity lasts longer. 
But there, there are questions, so we have learned the reinfection is possible, but we don't know. Um, uh, this is a new disease, and uh, the, there are few human that has been uh, more than a year, six, so, so we will learn more with, with time. And probably if you ask me in, in a year to do this talk, most of the lessons, so we're gonna learn more lessons than, and probably something that I told you that were not true. Epidemiological control. Well, the, the, the idea is that we don't want to saturate our healthcare system because the mortality is increased when our healthcare system capacity get overpassed. There's the idea that, that the flatter on the curve that the case present is low, we can manage then and uh, our mortality decrease. And, there, and we have positive examples. So in, in, in Vietnam, New Zealand, Taiwan, they were able, able to flat the curve and normalize and they only see sporadic cases. Uh, Korea also have initially was hit very bad, but they, 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 they have very aggressive strategy with uh, aggressive mass use test and isolation of the cases. So the surveillance is very important. And also Japan had to done a pretty good job. On that. Uh, no so good examples. Uh, Sweden, they wanted to, to see how, how it went and they have worse numbers than the other countries. United Kingdom initially, they want to watch and wait to intervene, probably thinking that getting the herd immunity faster and they, you know, they are not doing too well. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think we're a great example either. So, so we looked down, we were able to, to to control, but we didn't flat and we open prematurely and we have made uh, the mass a, a, a political argument. So that doesn't help at all. And I basically, so it's like a war, the US is you know, a, a great example of, of, of controlling the, the, this pandemic is bad. So, but we have a lot of cases to learn and then how to treat the sick ones that we're, we're sharing here with you guys. Um, we're doing pretty good, so we're gonna have time. So we're gonna talk about vaccination. So this is the virus. And we know in the virus, they have several uh, components. And this is the spike glycoprotein. Uh, but we have other membrane proteins too. We have nucleoproteins in, in the inside. We have the or RNA. And we know the virus with the, this spike protein gets to the ACE2 inhibitors and infect the cell and use the, the, the cell to assembling and export other viruses to the other cells. We know these antibodies that goes to the spike, spike glycoprotein is a neutralizing antibodies. We know there are other antibodies, but they don't, then don't neutralize. This spike protein is the target of all the vaccines because those neutralize and that basically block for infecting the cell, okay? What vaccines, the, 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 the virus is the, for the technology, but at the end, the product is the same. So we had different type of vaccines. We have vaccine that are the whole virus that gets dead or deactivated. Uh, so an example of those is the influenza vaccine. We have protein subunit vir uh, vaccine, like a pneumococcal vaccine they use. There are viral vectors that we use a, a, a vector, a, vir a virus that has been deactivated and just use like a Troy uh, horse to have the spike protein. It's, uh, it's an, one example is the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there is a new technology that the RNA uh, vaccine. Okay. The mRNA vaccine, so the one that has been used in the U.S., it has been uh, approved in the U.S. for emerging use authorization, and we have two of them, the Moderna and the Pfizer. Uh, it's a new platform that involves deliver uh, the RNA to the macrophage, and the macrophage produces spike glycoprotein. Uh, when the, gly the glycoprotein is produced, the immune system produces antibodies. 
There's no real virus in, 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 in these vaccines. There's no risk of developing the disease from the vaccine. The other thing is RNA, uh, messenger RNA, there are no genetic material. It's just basically a cooking recipe for the macrophage to produce the protein. So it's no way that can be inserted into the DNA because we don't have that enzyme. So it's a viral enzyme. And it's just basically to that particular protein that I showed you in the first cartoon of the virus, okay? The Pfizer, uh, the emerging authorization was granted in, in December 11. Uh, it's being approved in the US for 16 year old and older. There are two doses apart, 20, uh, three weeks apart, two doses intramuscular in, 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 the, in, in the arm. Um, so the primary endpoints, efficacy and safety. The initial uh, clinical trial have over 40,000 individuals enrolled and uh, more than 20,000 received the vaccine and more than 20,000 received the placebo. Uh, there were confirmed cases of, of, of COVID-19 after the, the second dose. And uh, so basically what we, we, we found that it then, then there the were 162 cases in the placebo group and only eight cases in the vaccine group. There was an efficacy of 95%. And the other thing is also there was a, an, an, in, an amazing protection for the severe disease. So there were ten cases of severe disease, nine on, nine on the placebo, only in the vaccine, vaccine group. So the answer to the question about efficacy and about safety, I mean, most of the, the patients complain of pain in the site of injection, mild symptoms, 70% uh, fever, fatigue, headache, and there were four serious events. Uh, one patient had a shoulder injury due administration, axillary adenopathy. Uh, I don't know if that shoulder injury was related to the technique or no. Uh, so I remember really, after, so when you see like a 40,000 uh, of patients and only four serious events, and the, the, there was no, no, nothing serious. Uh, four individuals had Bell's palsy too. And uh, probably this, 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 this is a graph that, that, that shows how effective is the vaccine. This is the individual that got the vaccine, okay? And they are the one that got the placebo and there are the cases of, and, uh, and, and if we prolong this, this curve keeps, you know, this is amazing. This is, uh, only few vaccines have these, 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 these data. So the, the moms, uh, MMR, uh, even the influence is not as fatty as this vaccine. And, uh, and uh, after one week after the second shot, uh, the, is when, when this, this curve, they diverge dramatically. The other vaccine that, that was uh, this Moderna vaccine was authorized a week after. There was only authorized for older than 18 year old, and it's because the, the, the clinical trial, the, the way that was designed, there are two doses, 28 days apart, four weeks. Um, the same, they, they, they were 30,000 in individuals, 15,000, 50,000, uh, more than 96% of the enrolled individual got the bus injection, and uh, the, the same thing, so efficacy and safety. There were 185 symptomatic cases in the placebo group and versus 11 in the vaccine group, and there was zero uh, severe cases in the vaccine group. So similar numbers, and we see the core is probably the same thing. This is uh, the, the one that got the placebo, and this is the one that who got the Moderna shot. It's basically only a few cases. So in internal safety, I mean, same thing that the other vaccine, they're very similar. Uh, pain and the sinus injections. There were some systemic uh, adverse reaction. In, in, so most of them, they were like a fever, malaise, muscle lakes, and, and, and they lasted less than 48 hours. And there were three deaths in the placebo group and two deaths in the vaccine group. And one of the deaths in the vaccine group was suicide. Uh, Bell's palsy occurred in, 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 in the vaccine tree and uh, one in the placebo. So Bell's palsy can, can, can happen you know, regardless of the vaccine is true or no. So I had to disclose that for until a couple of days ago, uh, 
we have vaccinated 25,000 in the Baptist system. Uh, that include healthcare worker and some of the patients um, older than 65, a member of the community that have risk. And uh, we haven't seen serious uh, events, uh, some allergic reaction, but nothing to nothing, nothing serious. So uh, th this number is is close to the number that, that had the clinical trial. So. Uh, we're happy and very confident that, 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 that Baptist is delivering this to the community to and to all the doctors. The other vaccine development for prevention of COVID-19, the AstraZeneca vaccine that is not being approved in the US yet, but it has been approved emerging authorization in the United Kingdom, India, and Mexico. Use a, 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 a technology that being used for the vaccine is a use a, a chimpanzee adenovirus, a, a cold adenovirus from chimpanzee that is non-active and cannot replicate, but they have the spike protein and the immune response goes to this uh, against the spy, spike protein. Advantage is cheaper and easy to distribute and uh, probably is gonna be more available for, for countries in, in, in the third world. Uh, with other, other uh, similar vaccine, the, the Sputnik use the same technology. A couple of the Chinese vaccines use the same technology using adenovirus. Uh, There's another Novavax that they use nanotechnology. Also, what it's trying to deliver is the, the nanoparticle with, with the spike protein. So stay tuned. This is a new technology and, uh, and um, the, the phase one and phase two uh, the data show uh, a strong antibody response. We'll see how it goes. It's still study. And that uh, is the, the Janssen vaccine candidate. This also use human adenovirus uh, to, and, and probably one of the advantages is that it's, it's going to be only a single dose. So that makes things much easier. Well, I want to thank, uh, of course, the Baptist system for, for I me. Mean, so uh, for me, it's a privilege to work in, in, in this uh, facility or patients and family. And uh, this is my, 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 my crew, uh, South Florida Infectious Disease Tropical Medical Center. So um, some of the slides and the information that come also from other doctors, Dr. Murillo, Dr. Torres Viera, Dr. Mejia, Dr. Gomez. I mean, I feel blessed to, to, to work in, in, in Baptist and, and to be part of this group and, and to, and to uh, FIU and School of Medicine. Um, and uh, I think we have time for questions. Thank you so very much, Dr. Torres Madres. Uh, what a phenomenal presentation. That's a great recap. Uh, we have a slew of questions and uh, you brought so many important topics to the surface that uh, we wanna make sure that we are highlighting. These 10 lessons that you shared with us have not gone unnoticed. Uh, since the initial of the pandemic, we have seen a shift in thoughts and in methodology, not only in treatment, but also in the ideas of how to prevent the transmission of the virus throughout our communities. So there has been a lot of conversation, a lot of changes, as a matter of fact, on a daily basis, because the situation is so fluid. It appears to be that uh, we have been expecting the pandemic to explode at any given point with any of the viruses that we know uh, that uh, have been already brewing in some areas or foci around the world. However, one of the uh, important lessons that we also have learned from the public health perspective is the preparedness in order for us to uh, foresee uh, eventualities in some areas in the world, in order for us to start the prevention methods that we are now arguing, and as you very well stated, politicized in such a negative way. One of the biggest lessons we learned is obviously uh, something that goes against our human nature, which is social distancing. It is a term that has, uh, uh, reverberated uh, and as well uh, has uh, made people uncomfortable. How in the heck am I going to social distance? What does that mean? The other lesson was, well, you need to protect yourself. You need to use a mask and you need to make sure that you, if you have been exposed, that you are protecting yourself. 
So now we have shifted from now understanding that we need to protect ourselves from now, are we going to be able to receive the vaccine? And now, as you probably have heard, there are folk guys in around the world saying that uh, the vaccine is detrimental to the health of people. So we want to make sure that at the end of this conference, we want to make sure we deliver that strong message you gave us about the efficacy and efficiency of this particular vaccine, the mRNA vaccines that we already have developed. Uh, so uh, it is extremely imperative that uh, we are all in agreement, especially those that are in healthcare. We're going to go ahead and open for questions. And uh, I have a, the distinct pleasure of uh, having here uh, the Consul General of Japan, the Honorable Kenji Hirata, Hirata uh, who is asking or actually stating, thank you for organizing the webinar. My question is, when can we expect reasonably to resume our old normal activities in the current uh, paces of infection and vaccination continues? I am looking forward to listening to the specialist. Well, so it's hard to predict. It's going to be, so having a vaccine is not enough. So it's, it's the act of vaccination. Once we have, we sped that the 70% of the population have immunity, either by acquiring the disease or by vaccination, we will expect to go to normal. How long is it going to take that? We don't know. Okay, as I, as, I use, as I just said, Hakim, so it has been some resistance to get vaccination. It's also, also some difficulties to produce the vaccine and to the delivery and to administer to the public. Uh, we're optimistic. We're optimistic that if everything goes well. We're hoping that by fall of the year, we have certain normality. Okay, but, but you, you, we, we, we have to wait and see. We do. And, and uh, one of uh, the important things to mention as well, uh, Dr. Torres Madrid, is the fact that uh, those other vaccines that are coming to fruition and that are about to be explored uh, are not necessarily as, um, as uh, difficult to administer or as to store as the ones that we currently have here in the United States, like the Pfizer vaccine, as you mentioned, and the Moderna vaccine. And, uh, and now with the advent of the new vaccine technology that we are seeing, there might be actually a reason to uh, store it liberally in uh, less, less stringent methods, as well as using one dose instead of two. So uh, there is a lot of conversation, you're absolutely right, uh, but there is also from the NIH, uh, we have seen direction that um, despite the fact that we are vaccinating, uh, we have to continue to protect ourselves beyond fall and perhaps it becomes the other stupid term that we have accustomed to, uh, getting accustomed to, which is the new normal. So uh, that is a phenomenal point. Uh, what is the best practice guidelines to use the rapid testing, the, la the lateral flow testing for COVID antigen and antigen kits? Is it accurate? Um, is it accurately sufficient for clinical use? Well, you know, everything has to place in perspective with the clinical of the patient. So you had a patient highly su suggested have, uh, uh, they have an exposure and they have the symptom and you have a negative test that is not sufficient. Probably you tested too soon and you had to retest in 24 hours. Uh, as the same thing applies with PCR. So history is key. And then the history you take by talking to the patient, evaluating the exposure, the was a real exposure or no, and the symptoms, and also knowing how is the activity of your community. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a question regarding uh, the qualification in order for uh, the patient to qualify, and it has to do with uh, transplant patients. Uh, with transplant uh, patients or, um, that are immunosuppressed, uh, are they candidates for the vaccination? Can they actually take the vaccine? We, actually, in the Miami Cancer Institute, we had a plan to vaccinate our transplant patients. Uh, there, there, there is no risk of the of of acquiring the disease because this vaccine doesn't. They don't have 
virus. They have just particle. The only problem could be that probably they are no immune or immunogenic enough, and probably could be not effective enough. But we don't. We're not concerned about uh, uh, about side effects. Probably more concerned about efficacies. But we're gonna go ahead and vaccinate or or immunocompromised patients. <laughs> Uh, how long does the antibody last after uh, we receive the uh, the dose? The second well, dose? so we know for for data from natural immunity that we have antibody for for six months or more. Remember, this is an evolving. Uh, so we, th this is happening in real time. So the clinical trials of the vaccine starting in in the summer. We don't have even a year of people to get vaccinated. We have some models to see the declining of the antibody and, the, and we have some predictions of mathematical model with the Moderna vaccine that probably the antibody could last for two years, but it has to be proven. You know, this is just a, a, a mathematical and model and we have to continue to follow the patient with the vaccine. But we know at least for six months, we are covered. Right. Until we probably, uh, uh, there is also a school of thought that uh, perhaps it will become like the influenza vaccine, that it would have to be a yearly uh, type dose, and that we do not know at this point either. We, so, don't, know, we don't know where we're going to need a booster, if we're going to need a booster at all. And also, we don't know, and I probably, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a question about the new variants. So, the data that we have is the new variants are covered with the vaccine, but you know, virus they mutate and they change. We don't know in the future, they're gonna mutate enough that we would need to have another vaccine, but at least we have the technology. So we don't know that. Well, sure. I'm, glad that I'm glad you mentioned it because obviously these two variants that uh, are taking uh, some kind of a toll on the population in England, as well as uh, the African nations um, has, um, it, it is already as, as uh, you guys in science have said uh, it's already in study. And as you stated, it is covered by the current vaccines. However, the variants that we are to see in the future are obviously it's an unknown. So we're going into an uncharted territory until we find um, a, a way of understanding how this virus is really behaving. Uh, now, there's a question regarding the, uh, the uh, treatment and perhaps the use of uh, uh, ivermectin as, uh, as uh, perhaps a prophylactic type method. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you, so we, we had two, two little strong data of well done clinical tri trials with ivermectin. So we know that everything generated from a paper in Australia, Australia they have in vitro uh, show like inhibitor replica replication of the virus. We in Baptist Pharmacy, we, we, we analyzed the paper and the concentrations of the ivermectin needed to inhibit the, the, the virus. They were neurotoxic. Um, uh, so I, I, we have the feeling, we have the feeling that, that, that this is like the, the new hydroxychloroquine. There are people begging to have something with her without, and we learn our lesson. So we use hydroxychloroquine in the, in, in the past and it didn't work. I didn't change anything. So until we have very well done clinical trials addressing that issue, we're not gonna use Evermectin, at least in Baptist. Correct. Uh, Everard, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, sure. And it actually is not just a question uh, uh, of me, but I, I read in the uh, chat that uh, someone called Dean Marie White posed the question that I know that many of the uh, 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 participants of Synergy will, will surely have. It's about the reservation about the hurriedly prepared vaccines and their efficacy, um, because we know that uh, some people, um, our patients might not be willing to take the vaccine, although uh, Gilberto said how important that is. Um, so what could we do to convince these people to, uh, to, to, to take the vaccine and, 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 and explain to them that it really makes sense to do so? 
Well, I think one thing is lead by example. So I think the, the leaders of the community have to, to get the vaccine. I got my, the vaccine myself. Um, I was one of the first that got, and I'm just trying just to talk, convince, and, and I think the more people get vaccinated and people know somebody who got vaccinated and show that it has no side effect, it, it's, it, it, it's gonna increase. But I mean, this is a Titanic effort because the social media, I mean, the infodemic in the, in the social media, guys, uh, the vaccine is, you know, it, it, it's there. So we have to be, every one of us has to, to communicate and, and lead by example. And, and um, so it's hard, but I think, I think the, the humanity will prevail. And uh, we have had pandemics in the past also. And uh, the, the history of the humanity, as you know, is the history of pandemics also. And we also prevail. So one way or the other, and I think science is in our side. So I'm very optimistic. Um, we are too. Uh, Dr. Torres Madrid, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, this particular question that ever posed, uh, it is a concern for many around the globe, even here in the United States, uh, where uh, we're constantly bombarded with information. One thing that we need to actually share with our communities, aside from actually doing the right thing, which is lead by example, is also show the nature of the results of the science. Uh, the fact of the matter is that for us to develop a vaccine takes many, many years. We have known that forever. It takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of resources. Warp speed, as we call it here in the United States, it is a term reserved for this activation, immediate activation and pouring of resources into science and focusing only in the science in order for us to come out with those vaccines the incredible accomplishments of these two companies and the others around the world for the vaccine development has been remarkable. Just to be a 95% efficacy, it is absolutely something that must be publicized and shared with everybody. So uh, as just as you, I also got vaccinated, got my second dose, got, got uh, willing, we would not have to uh, continue this mess in the future. Um, there are so many important questions, uh, Dr. Torres Madrid, and um, one that comes to mind is about reinfection. Um, do you think that uh, we will be able to get reinfected after um, we get our vaccination? What is your thought from the infectious disease component? So, so the question is, do you get reinfected if you go to the vaccine? But if you got reinfected because you got the vaccine, so you got the infection before the vaccine. So what are your question? You got infection and you got the, the, get the vaccine and get reinfected? Well, the, the question is, uh, you know, we got uh, the vaccination and then a period elapses and then we got infected. We know for a fact what you just stated, that if a person tests positive right after a vaccine is because they already got the infection before they got vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. You know what, what I said, I wanna uh, share, share, so we have some patients that got infected after the first dose, elderly patient, and they got very mild disease. The data we know that, that the vaccine is protective, it's not 100%, but definitely it's highly protective against severe infection. So we think that even if you get the infection after getting vaccinated, you probably, your disease is gonna be mild and not okay. severe. All right. And in, in, in that ties in into Sonia's question, that is uh, right after you receive your second dose, let's say that you are already uh, uh, on your way to be immunized, uh, would you be able to actually be uh, among people that are infected with the virus? Well, I, I'm as a physician, so every time that I have an encounter with a patient, I, I wear a mask. So... Uh, we don't know how high is going to be the viral load of the patient, the, the, the person that's infected. So if somebody's infected, that person needs to wear a mask and uh, we'll be very cautious uh, dealing with infected people. So. 
Correct, correct. Um, a few more questions, uh, but um, we're at the top of the hour and uh, I have a uh, comment here. It says, thanks for the response. However, I am in Jamaica and the midst of uh, reservations here um, are real. Uh, Dr. Hakim mentioned it um, about the many years and normal takes to develop a safe vaccine. The COVID, COVID vaccine does not have the character uh, will this be one-time vaccination or like polio drops on BCG vaccine, or it will be an annual uh, like the flu shot? So we don't know. I have to say so something, even though we got this vaccine very fast, the technology behind the vaccine have many, many, many years on the knowledge. Though that this vaccine didn't come out of nothing in, 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 in 10 months. No, we have knowledge about other coronavirus, we have knowledge about SARS-1 uh, and MERS, and we know that the, the spy protein of those viruses was key. So uh, the M RNA, messenger RNA technologies also have probably 10 years of use. So we, we didn't invent anything out of the nothing. So we use knowledge that we have. On, on, on other hand, and we have a lot, a lot of money and we have a, a lot of patients. In order to get a clinical trial to recruit 30,000 for another thing, takes five, 10 years, we got that in record time. Mm -hmm. And we also had a decision, we can prove efficacy. I mean, I have to, to assure you guys that we didn't leave any safety uh, check on this. The, when we said this vaccine is safe, it's safe. and and uh, we were lucky enough to that everything was got together to get a, an effective vaccine. Is that vaccine we're gonna need to take a vaccine in a year or two? We don't know. And it's only times we predict. It may happen that, that same like uh, the SARS-1 and the MERS, at the end we have her immunity, the, 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 the disease will disappear, we don't know. And probably we, will, we won't need more vaccination. But for now, we know what we know now is that we need to get vaccinated and then we'll see it, the times will tell us. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one concern a, um, a viewer has, it's um, would it be wise to actually continue social distancing after we achieve 70% immunization in our community? Um, I would say yes, until, until we have activity of the virus in our community. So, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna get back to normal at some point. Thank you for the optimism. And uh, if you miss the second dose, is that bad? What happens if you just miss it completely, the second dose? Well, so the clinical trial data is with two doses, but we saw that after two weeks at the first dose, people have antibodies. So, uh -huh. so probably it's gonna be, it's not gonna be 95% effective, but it may provide some, some, some protection. Listen, uh, Dr. Torres Madrid, you know we can keep you an entire day and the entire summit will be asking you questions about yeah, this. And I, I have to go back to see patients. And I know you have to go back where our hospitals are filled. And uh, with that, uh, we are at the top of the hour. And I want to thank you on behalf of Baptist Health International for your incredible presentation and for your kindness and joining us today. To all of you for attending uh, from the different parts of the world, we are so honored that you were able to join us. We're here to serve you and we look forward to developing a mutual collaborative relationship in the near future. If you have additional questions as the ones you already posted, uh, please call us at 786-596-2373 or send us a message at the email address displayed on the screen. Uh, thank you again, uh, and please stay safe, wear a mask, get vaccinated, continue social distancing. As, as soon as your vaccine is available in your community, please take advantage of it and get vaccinated. Until next time, have a great day. Everard, thank you so much for the invitation and for joining us today. Yes, thank you uh, all. Thank you, Galit, uh, and uh, your people uh, who made this uh, possible from Baptist Health International. Uh, on behalf of, uh, of uh, Synergy. Um, I would like to thank, uh, of course, the pre presenter, Dr. Gilberto Torres Madrid, for his interesting presentation and the even more interesting discussion thereafter. 
Um, I thank the participants. Uh, I'm sorry that not all questions could be answered. Uh, there were so many. So we just had to pick a few. Um, and uh, if I think if there is one takeaway of this uh, presentation, I would like to share you with the optimism that Dr. Torres Madrid had that we get back to normal, although we don't know when. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for being with us. Uh, hope to meet again and uh, uh, stay healthy. For the Synergy people, I would like to remind them that now there is a possibility to join us in the second meeting uh, with another uh, a Zoom link. Thank you and hope to see you again. Thank you so much, Heber. Thank you, Dr. Torres-Mendez. Thank Have you, a please say, get vaccinated. Bye. Bye.